Hi, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Wherever you are in the world, thank you very much for joining us today on our webinar, our Thursday with Thames. Thames is one of the kind in of natural voice society. We cut across different sectors. Uh, we are a society that uh, covers different areas of um, researches, innovations uh, for large, medium, and small enterprises. We also is one of the longest in our societies. Uh, next year, we are 70 years of society uh, in different form. Um, in tech, we are uh, focused on people. And our, our tagline is leaders enabling product and services for good. And we, we focus on five areas. Uh, one of the area is moving the product and service from ideas to market. And we identify implement successful projects and systems, our members. We also integrate technology for capability and productivities. We develop engineers to leaders. And more importantly, we balance the norm between society, government, and regulators. So today's topic is really interesting. Many people, uh, uh, when Chisel proposed to us, we thought that was uh, an amazing topic, uh, and really appreciate that she uh, spent her time to organize the uh, the webinar for us. Uh, we're looking forward to your sessions, and I'm going to turn over to you. Um, welcome everyone again, and uh, you know, as Andy mentioned, we have Jizzle Waters with us here today. Uh, she's the founder of Engineering Hearts, a researcher an educational psychologist and a writer with a critical eye on the ethical touch points between technology and humanity. She helps organizations apply an ethical scope to their analysis of engineering technology using educational philosophy, educational psychology, I'm sorry, and design research. Um, it's a privilege to have you here and you know, having looked at your slides with a sneak peek that you gave me yesterday, I'm very excited to be uh, hearing you speak today. Giselle, over to you. I uh, will start your presentation right now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be to be able to to speak to uh, the various participants around the world. Thank you for, for taking the time to listen to my presentation. And I I apologize in advance. This is sort of like a brain dump. Um, it's not uh, meant to be a teaching uh, exchange, of course. So you're going to get a lot of information. Uh, you'll sort and sift it in, in your good time uh, at your convenience. But I hope to share an insightful perspective on engineering education that you will not find in most traditional analyses of education programs. My aim here today is to help you think about engineering education as an opportunity for the transformation of not just the minds of engineers, but also their hearts. It seems like a lifetime ago uh, that I started as an elementary school teacher. So that colors how I see human capacity and potential. Preparing children for adulthood continues to inform how I see all humans grow and develop, regardless of age or domain. Today, the intersection of engineering and ethics essentially is where I see an immense opportunity to develop better humans and especially good humans, because engineers now build things that have the capacity to transform billions of people's lives. Through software engineering specifically, which is what I focused on in these universities I analyzed, they can build technologies that, that definitely impact billions of people uh, across hundreds of jurisdictions uh, simultaneously. Through software engineering also, I wanted to focus on the technologies that uh, transcend distance values, human values, both operationally and societally. So my premise here is that this immense scale of impact demands a focus on how we develop both the minds and hearts of engineers. I argue that the scale that they create, that their creations, demand us to look at how we educate them and how the curricula and educational experiences can be designed for the engineers of tomorrow. 
I also aim to begin a conversation here about negotiating the intersection of humanity and technology included in engineering education. I see these programs as the spaces where engineers gain their brains and learn their pains that they will endure in their professional lifetimes. And by pains, I mean that teaching engineers how to negotiate ethical considerations during the life cycle of a software system should be learned in school first, then practiced in the field, hopefully with low risk business cases, similar to how doctors are trained under attending physicians, and then they're let loose onto the world. The challenges, the obstacles, constraints, all of these should be experienced in school first, and they can be designed into engineering education. So what does engineering hearts mean? The name engineering hearts is a little pun on the literal translation, which refers to the name to, to mechanically building the hearts, that's the literal, the figurative translation, developing the hearts of engineers, for example, in schools of uh, engineering, and then of course the noun itself referring to the hearts of the engineers. So let's look at who the future engineers will be. Next slide, please. Generation Z. Many of them will come from Generation Z. It's the largest cohort in the world with just under 2 billion youngsters between 10 to 24 years old. That's about 26% of the world's population. If you consider the top four largest of the subpopulation here in this chart, China, India, Indonesia, and the USA, just those four countries. What does that say about the competing political, economic, social, and legal values embedded in these societies, and from which all the technology will be built in the future? These demographics alone, without the elaboration of diverse controversies in AI, and without all the software engineering controversies, should begin to highlight an urgency for you. I'm hoping that you begin your considerations more deliberately about how to design educational experiences for engineers. Okay, next slide, please. So, a variety of software engineering and systems engineering includes going from where we are, which used to be just a, a, a cohort of a small local geography has now turned into the complexity of scale and the diversity of regulation that one software program can have. And it potentially impacts simultaneously hundreds of local jurisdictions and billions of people, of course, depending on the operating system. So that's challenging. That's challenging to teach to engineers. but. Getting them to understand that software impacts millions and billions of people is not the hard part. The harder part is teaching engineers how to build consensus across conflicting interests and competing value systems in totally different countries representing thousands of miles in, in distance and countless differences in values. Case in point, I've worked on IEEE's P7000 standard called the model process for addressing ethical concerns during system design. For the past three years, volunteering with systems and software engineers from all over the world. We're on our third draft. We've had two comments resolution group processes on the standard text. We're undergoing one ballot process. It's about to go into comments into the rest of the world. And we've had over 150 meetings online over three face-to-face -face meetings in Europe, and even more subgroup meetings working remotely in small groups. And we're all still working on the consensus of what ethical considerations mean in software engineering. But we're getting there. It doesn't mean it's impossible. It just means that we have to continue building consensus. Teaching consensus building skills on the why and how of system requirements and ethical value requirements in machine learning, for example, is extremely challenging, as I'm trying to illuminate. So the types of harms documented across the world, globally speaking, have thousands of AI ethics controversies in the headlines. 
and then this is not the presentation where I'm going to go through them. But here are just some really quick examples. Software engineering, machine learning, and AI can, for example, create financial insecurity by denying insurance. Due to biased algorithms. Biased algorithms can also place people in jail unjustly. They can keep someone in jail longer unjustly. They can fail someone out of school unfairly. They can exclude people from job opportunities unfairly. There are thousands of case studies around the world. These are all part of the reason why understanding how engineers are being taught is so important. So I'm going to review three universities that show promise on these efforts, but I will also provide some constructive criticism on the scope of their curriculum. Uh, one of the universities is still trying to grow their sea legs and may need some reflection, but I wanted to add it as, as a contrast to the other two to give you a sense of, of the major differences between probably what exists mostly in the world in terms of education and what are exemplary programs. Next slide, please. There's no scarcity in knowledge pro production on engineering ethics. I, I did a quick search on Amazon just for the top um, major textbooks. The world seems to be pressuring engineers to critically evaluate their ethical practices as they tackle these infinite international and socially complex problems that combine, of course, technical, social, and ethical challenges all in one. So tons of knowledge, but wisdom is much less available. My disclaimer here today with you is that I'm neither an engineer nor an ethicist, nor do I play either on TV. My, my constraints, though, are not either being loyal or uh, particular to a positive psychology or the virtue ethics of the world uh, when, when discussing and analyzing engineering education. I'm simply an educator and a design researcher, and I'm, and I'm interested in understanding how engineering programs teach. It's a separate question from what they learn. I'm interested in what they're teaching completely different inquiry would be on what they're learning and how they're learning. So I state at the top level of scoping curricula as represented by their undergraduate and graduate course descriptions online. I did not evaluate the course syllabi or the teacher's pedagogy and the student. That's another inquiry for another time and a much deeper dive into curricular components. Potentially that could be a lifetime of research if done right. So let's begin on how I define ethics and what it means to my analysis of software engineering. I had to focus on one type of engineering because there are too many categories to study. And even with the focus of one category, the landscapes blend across subject areas when programs redefine themselves in multidisciplinary ways. Correctly so, I might add, because socio-technical problems are almost always multidisciplinary and never compartmentalized. But let's start with the definition first and a reality check. Next slide, please. Thank you. So, ethos is a Greek word meaning character. I found great because uh, another little phrase I'll, I'll review in the next slide or, or so is that character is destiny. So, ethos also forms the root of the Greek word ethikos, meaning morality, showing moral character. The plural form, ta ethika, is an adjective meaning the study of morals. This is the origin of the modern English word. Now, if you Search online, look on peer reviewed journals, look for the great literature, you can find as many definitions of ethics as there are people. But I, um, I, I, center, I center my core around the definition that the Ethics Center in Australia uh, uses. And um, the center was uh, designed as a nonprofit many years ago, 25 years ago, by, I believe his name is, yes, Simon Longstaff. His definition goes something like this. Ethics is only possible when we act against our nature, based on our conscience. Now, remember, in psychology, psychopathology and psychosis, neurosis, have all affected people's consciences. And if there's anything that we can learn from history, is that we need to be reminded that there are many humans without a healthy conscience. So that's a completely separate presentation, but 
I, I, I land on the notion that ethics allows us to make judgments about what should happen. Of all the possible things that one can choose in a particular moment, in a particular social context in time, it tries to define our behavior from, of all the ways that you might act, which is the best. So it's nice, it's luxurious to talk about the definition of ethics, but at this very moment, uh, MIT Sloan Management is having another workshop for a completely different thing. And anyone who's attending is, as it says in quotes here, IT and business leaders want to speed their organization's AI-fueled ambitions, and they have an unprecedented opportunity here that requires informed strategic platform and architectural decisions. This was a, uh, a competing workshop that essentially is pushing the notion of the value of operational, commercial, business efficiency, profit making, and so on and so forth. A completely uh, contrasting, but simultaneously existing presentation. I put them side to side because I wanted to show the, the difficulty, the wedge, the, the in between the rock and the hard place that our engineers are in every single day. One of our, our participants shared with us, for example, a question. Uh, a civil engineer is placed in a design group to design a new thoroughfare that will divide a community between middle upper uh, upper middle neighborhoods and low income neighborhoods, cutting off streets and providing minimal pedestrian crossways. There are always engineers will always be in these conundrums, in these difficult conflicting positions. I can address how and what uh, to help manage or, or analyze that situation. Um, but that is another presentation, it's not about the university, uh, that I studied the, the ethical uh, infusing and integration inside their educational programming. Okay, thank you very much. Next slide. So engineers of the future, here's that lovely uh, saying, character is destiny, also by another Greek, um, Heraclitus. Uh, I think about what does ethics mean to people, and of course, we can all develop our own definition. But when you meet people, regardless of position, parents, doctors, nurses, teachers, as I say in the list on the left, you, you tend to have a sense very quickly about uh, their sense of uh, character and what kind of people they are by not only what they say, by what they do, which is the study of ethics and behavior. And you get, a, you get an idea that, you know, this is an average person. This is a, definitely a good egg. This is a good egg. I, I can count on them. They can be loyal. They will, they will be virtuous when, when things are difficult. And then there are a very, very small group of people that distinguish themselves where their ethics is very much aligned with high morals. And they are great people. And... It is not easy to go from one category to the next. But what I'm trying to share with you today is that in engineering education, you have a captive audience of about uh, four years of time to really build the characters and the brains, the minds and the hearts of engineers. So education to me, ever since I was uh, an elementary school teacher, has always meant education is transformation. And those experiences of education mean that from every aspect of life, from the womb till death, you have an ability to build character. And if there's anything else that you get from today's uh, talk, it's I want you to remember that education is transformation, it can be transformation, but it means that you have to de design it differently. Next slide, please. Nope. Nope. There you go. Okay, thank you. Um, so engineers of the future will be called upon to become leaders, not only in private organizations, but in nonprofits and government sectors. And so we must remember that good, even great engineers can make bad decisions. Good people make bad decisions all the time. And 
we have to think about how can engineering programs help develop good engineers that make good decisions most of the time. I think, and I'm proposing here, that one of the many ways is by teaching ethical reasoning. And ethical reasoning in the study that is specific to the social context in which the technology will be used, even though they may be hundreds of jurisdictions and thousands of miles of geography represented. Ethical reasoning is a skill that can be taught. So how about engineering education stress tests? How about stress testing engineers with conditions and constraints that reflect real world challenges, the extremes, the mundane, and the ordinary? I'm convinced that ethical reasoning is like a muscle, like the heart is a muscle. It must be flexed, and it can be used to help build character. Ethical reasoning is the crucial skill, in my opinion, of the engineers of the future, because emerging and complex issues related both to globalization and the human technology interactions require constantly, daily, that engineers think more daily, more deeply, sorry, about both the process and the impact of their work. So each year, thousands of newly educated engineers will face novel ethical issues, serious ethical issues. That are, uh, that are often raised by exponentially uh, advancing technology. Things like bio nanotechnology, neural link devices, educational attainment algorithms, autonomous criminal justice dispositioning, or contact tracing, and facial recognition that's used to track populations, in other words, population surveillance. There are among thousands of additional examples globally. So the reason why I'm interested in engineers is because they transform and build the world. And when engineers build and transform, social context matters. How and why they transform the nature and build technology matters. What do they have to draw from? In this slide, I'm showing just a little bit of the massive amounts of things that they must consider. Engineering standards, they're, they're changing. We're working on, on the intersection of ethics into engineering standards. The engineering standards are the do's. The laws, regardless of, of jurisdiction, are just are necessarily the don'ts. Frameworks and guides, hundreds and thousands of them available. Codes of ethics, the shoulds. So engineering education tends to place themselves in the how. This is how engineers will transform and build the world. Engineering ethics is potentially the why. It's important now to really understand that an engineer never, rarely, if ever, makes a decision by himself or herself. It is almost always amongst a team and indefinitely um, serving the interests of an organization. Next slide, please. So how did I come to the three universities that I chose. I began to think about, of course, accreditation uh, organizations and Abbott, the Accreditation Board of Engineering and Technology, founded in 1932. They proposed an exemplary framework for looking at programs that do engineering well and um, implement beyond just the norm of um, a variety of content and subject matter expertise, but that do the following six things in their program. They blur disciplinary borders. They uh, have a holistic approach to problem solving. They are informed by business, have customizable curricula. They tend to uh, implement dynamic hands-on team learning. And of course, they have aligned effects. On the right-hand side of the chart, you can see and I've interpreted what this means to the engineers in the programs. So when I saw this framework, I thought to myself, let me start there. Let me look at the exemplary programs that are doing it very well and who they are. And of course, uh, the National Academy of, of Engineering and the Center for Engineering Ethics Society had done a report a couple years ago, and they chose 25 universities that showed exemplary uh, programmatic implementation. And of all of the 25, uh, 
Um, my one that I focused on was Purdue. So that list, of course, is available to you. But they mirrored this particular framework, this framework in front, um, in, in all sorts of ways. And, and I'll discuss in detail later. Monash University in Australia, Purdue is in the USA, also came out in the wash, um, not a part, of course, of the national picture that was in the National Academy of Engineering. But um, Monash has just gained world university rankings uh, in the Times Higher Ed list and shows incredible depth and promise uh, with respect to their, their engineering education programs. So that was a hand pick outside, uh, but it was also a world recognized university. One came from the list of 25. Um, by the NAE and the CES. And then Roboro University um, was chosen not just because the Institute of Engineering and Technology has it on a list of recognized universities that teach engineering well, but they have a center for education, teaching, and excellence that has provided uh, some, some advocacy and, and content to a very well-recognized engineering ethics guide used in the United Kingdom. So I'm going to focus on those three. And let's see um, how I can share my findings with you. Next slide, please. OK. So the first, Lowborough University, um, I start there. And I start with a critical evaluation of it. Because as you looked at the curriculum, uh, that's available online at the descriptive of the core curriculum level for a, uh, a bachelor's in, in engineering or a master's in engineering. There's really actually no obvious way that this particular curricula was saying ethics was embedded in any of the coursework. And one scratch at that was simply, of course, doing a find for the word and opening up every description to looking at whether or not they even discuss it. And so in that particular university, for the front face of digital pages, I could not find any discussion per se about that. And uh, outside of the School of Engineering, they did have a bachelor's in science and design and technology where the, the curriculum discussed ethical interactions with users and that students would be learning how to do that. But again, that was not a part of the programs. So, okay, next slide. Purdue University was a part of the, that 25. And I've listed here some of their coursework and classes, ethics and professionalism and technology, for example. You had to be a senior standing taking that course, engineering, design, ethics, and entrepreneurship. Um, that was some basic concepts in design process, but they imbued it with other engineering topics. And one of the last courses, ECE 4100, engineering, ethics, and professionalism, which is more of a top level surface, let's look at professional codes of ethics. But it was named a top engineering ethics program, not just because it had uh, these three or four courses that um, were presented modularly, you know, yes, separately. And this was specific to electrical and computer engineering, but because it has a interesting multidisciplinary program called Prime Ethics, and it's uh, Purdue's reflective and interactive module for engineering ethics. It's known as an exemplary educational research program because it infuses ethics into um, not just one, one kind of engineering, but a multidisciplinary category of engineering. So in contrast to Lowborough in the UK, you can see that one engineering uh, education program just sort of ignores the topic of ethics, even the topics of ethics, the topic of ethics at the conceptual level. And Purdue takes it one level higher, not only has 
courses that occur across semesters in one particular university program, but also has a reflective um, module that crosses the different specialties in engineering as well. Thank you very much. Oh, yes, sorry, before you go on. Um, one of the things about Purdue that was fascinating is that they purposefully and deliberately teach ethical reasoning. And one of the criteria on top of the Abbott framework to look for which programs are infusing ethics better was my criteria, which was, are they teaching students ethical reasoning? And Purdue is doing that. Not only are they teaching ethics, but they are researching about how engineers reason ethically. So they have an, deeper, an even deeper level of addressing this than many, many programs. Okay, next slide, please. Great. So Monash is a unique little beast, a unique and rare bird. Uh, when I look at the framework that I use, the Abbott framework and then the ethical reasoning criteria, I also added a third slicer, and that was are engineering programs at this next level not only teaching ethics conceptually, embedding it into the curriculum, ingraining it in the program, uh, addressing ethical, ethical reasoning skills in engineering students? This next level represents uh, probably the deepest level that I've found thus far, and Monash is reflective of that. And that is that the software engineering program as a whole. Yes, has the classes. Yes, embeds it across uh, multiple speciali specializations of engineering. This one in particular that I showed for you here, um, I'll, I'll show you the classes as well. But they get to the machine level of investigating how values are embedded at the code level. How is it that human values are traced in the technology that's being created? So one of the great things about Monash is, yes, on the top left, for example, the happy face, I see, it's teaching them the KSAs, the knowledge, skills, and abilities of all specs, the professional autonomy, the professional agency. These are the kinds of things that almost all engineer, engineering programs do recently. But um, I've noted that the left-hand side, very rarely in any engineering curricula, are any of these issues on the left uh, directly taught in any specific form. So engineers are going to have to deal with these kinds of things on the left. They're going to have to deal with the polarization, not only of society at large, but there's polarization within your own teams. Partisanship, partiality, there's going to be interdepartmental conflict, there's going to be inflexible policies in the organization. There's going to be literally wanton disregard. The list is there. But as we grow up in our lives, we have, we're not necessarily formally taught that all these things occur. And they're occurring while you're trying to do good, and they're occurring while maybe you don't care. But it's happening. And um, I think most universities are missing the opportunity to think about how it is that not only do we teach subject matter, and not only do we infuse ethics, but we can also introduce behavior and, and how behavior makes a difference in the ethical reasoning for the choices to build certain technology. Um, next slide, please. All right, so here is the, the curriculum uh, for software engineering folks at Monash. And I've pointed out the one, two, three specific ones to this particular page. Uh, of the course using ethical considerations for project implementation. That sounds great. We also have the one FIT 3170 in the middle there. It's a full year of developmental project in a, quote, self-managing team that includes identifying appropriate action based uh, on relevant laws and codes of ethical behavior. There, it's literally, that's how it's marketed. And I, it's exciting to read it. Um, 
There's also a FIT FIT 4003 extended course using ethical considerations, again, for project implementation research. So you can start to see the big difference between how Monash and Lowborough, those two extremes, really infused, embedded, ingrained ethics on the one end, and Lowborough missing the boat, perhaps, on, on their end, needing some growth. So for commencing students, yes, next slide, please. Now, what was fascinating to me about this curriculum, um, same, same uh, set of students, they, uh, Bachelor of Engineering, and it's an honors. It's an interesting contradiction when the engineering courses are described as follows. <laughs> engineering design, lighter, faster, stronger. Engineering design, cleaner, safer, smarter. <laughs> cleaner, safer, smarter. Lighter, faster, stronger. Those are values of efficiency, optimization, uh, commercialized uh, profit. Those are um, a set of values that say what's important. And so this is sort of the, the contradiction in the curriculum in which they are infusing and embedding ethics and ingraining it. But at the same time, the messaging to students while they're learning is, yes, we're going to also help you build cleaner, safer, smarter technology. We're going to also help you build lighter, faster, stronger technology. So my next step, if ever I get there, would definitely be to, this is what they say they're teaching, to help understand, to understand what is actually being learned. And how, how does that play out in, in, in an ethical you know, controversy? It would be very interesting to, to, to look further in that. So that's why I, I put a little smirky face in that. Okay, next, next slide, please. Monash is also doing the following. It has uh, a lab. It's called the Operationalizing Values in Software Lab, the OVISLAB.net. And I gave it a stamp of, gave it a stamp for engineering hearts because they're doing some incredible research. So not only are they embedding and ingraining uh, it's a part of their ethos, as I will describe later in a little summary, but this is the type of research that is, that is happening in the lab. So some of the engineers may or may not be a part of this, but uh, particular researchers and faculty that are part of the engineering are already looking at how human values, for example, on the top right, are being modeled in software. And they're creating a comprehensive framework of how human values are being modeled in software. Then the notion that this university um, has a very high level of ethics integration in education program is shown by the nature of the research and science that they're doing on the technology itself. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Hello? Oh, okay, thank you. So, all right, so here, um, when you see this separately, hope, I know it's very hard to see. I'm sorry for that, but there's a lot of information in there. So what I ranked them as was a one star, one first level with low borough, second was Purdue. They're doing great, but everyone always at any time can do better, right? So the third level three type of uh, integration was Monash. And uh, I'm not going to read this to you. Or I'm going out of time because there's just too much to learn. But I do summarize exactly my findings on their curricular uh, components, and I discuss a little bit of how they are different. In all three instances, I have also gone a slightly deeper and had conversations with at least either a student or a faculty member to probe a bit further qualitatively what's happening in their program. So to Lowborough's uh, university's credit, I had an exchange with uh, Dr. Melanie King, who's a part of the engineering school, and she's doing some incredible work uh, that's looking at how uh, technology and, and, and software systems engineering is impacting the insurance um, criteria for, for insurance benefits. And so that the fact that one engineering faculty is investigating these types of things that are high impact decisions 
on a person's life uh, gives me great hope that uh, that Lowboro is 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 at least reflecting on on these very very hard issues of, of engineering. So Purdue and Monash uh, level two and level three. Next slide. Please. So this is what ends up happening. Um, my question was, how are ethics being addressed in computer engineering uh, programs? And so globally, I would say the bulk of most engineering programs, and besides the 25 and the additional two for the 27, I have probably reviewed 100 different curricula of just regular, everyday uh, engineering programs all over the world that are, that are not even asking the question. That are not even uh, there yet. They're they're not ready for the conversation. So, but there are engineering programs that embed ethical considerations, and only a select few that ingrain ethics into their programs at the ethos level, at the character level of their whole program. And this is how I divide uh, divided the three so that they are sort of examples of these groupings, and they are reflective of each of the levels. Level one, they're conceptualizing ethics into their program. Level two, they're embedding it into the program. Level three, it definitely is ingrained into the program. And not only have they integrated into coursework and modules and research and themes, but they are also now looking at the system requirements of the requirements engineering themselves in the technology itself. So to get to level three, uh, I bet you I could count, you know, on my body only the amount of programs that are in, in this level of, of, of ethics integration. Next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, so that's how it played out. Lobra is level one, Purdue is level two, Monash is level three. Again, uh, feel free to look at the detailed work there. I'm not going to say it to you, but in all cases, Regardless, growth can, can be had. And so, and Lobo definitely needs a lot of focus and growth is needed. Purdue strengthening up. Um, there's a variety of opportunities in even just their regular programming that can address use case issues that might teach engineering students uh, a better way of ethical reasoning than just looking at it very directly. Uh, in Monash as well, optimization, I think that they're such a great program that they could now, uh, and they probably are, actually, um, looking to discuss uh, with pr the private sector and regulation in Australia as to how their model um, can be replicated in other areas and how, and how their work is unique enough that, uh, that the study of their engineering students could also become its own research and baseline uh, foundation for knowledge in this field. Next slide, please. So again, I've said, uh, my question was, how are they taught, not how do they learn, not um, what are they learning, because a curriculum is a starting point, right? It's not what actually occurs in the learning, it's only a signal as to what we want you to learn. So that's a different question. But my, my argument here is that you have four years with students, and that's an expanded opportunity to teach and organize experiences that can transform mind and heart. So that's what I'm leaving you with, is sort of the question is, how does that happen? Um, one of the participants, uh, I hope that's here today, uh, Neil, brought out a very important question, which was, how does fortitude get developed in engineers? And my answer to him, of course, that, and, and it's also an answer to another posted question, is how is it that these kinds of cardinal virtues can be taught in engineering education, or can they be taught in engineering? And I changed my answer to him. I, I think that the four years that engineers are in, in, in a school 
is an extended opportunity in which with a very particular maybe education psychologist or with with people that are multidisciplinary and have had interdisciplinary experiences could help universities understand the ways that they implement use cases, um, how they can use ethical risk analysis and ethical reasoning in those use cases where perhaps these cardinal virtues have, have a chance of playing out, of being tested, of being stress tested. And so I would argue that, that it is possible. Um, I think Monash is a good example of trying to get there. Because if you're having a discussion about what human values exist in the code of the technology that's being developed, then you're going to have a better opportunity to be able to have the discussions about, well, if you have a certain value and I have a certain value, how do those things conflict or collaborate when we're building the same program? So um, one other note here. I found it interesting that the modern version of Plato's cardinal virtues sort of were reflecting uh, the, the Harvard Business Review's it's, um, it's sort of a little manual on emotional intelligence element. And they, they kind of, I'm just a suggestion here, that prudence is a little bit like self-awareness. Temperance is a little bit like self-management. Justice is, is a little bit like social awareness and fortitude. Kind of relationship management. It's, it's just a positioning. But Engineering Hearts is also uh, presenting here uh, an ethical reasoning heuristic, um, which would be helpful in just a starting point to get teams, engineering teams, regardless of whether they're in an educational program or in private industry, they could get started on, on asking themselves some questions. Next slide, please. And that will be. Next slide, please. There you go. Okay, so Monash got to the requirements engineering. And there's going to be more slides in, in this presentation than I'm able to discuss today. But essentially, what I wanted to um, just immediately uh, look at for 10 seconds is that this is what engineers are learning already. They're learning at what a desired system behavior should be. So even in the subject matter expertise of what systems and software engineers are learning is an opportunity to discuss where is ethics in this desired system? How is the system behavior being designed to be ethical or not? Next slide, please. <clears throat> Okay, great. So we've got some references, and in light of the amount of time, I went through probably too much too fast, but I'd like to open it up to questions. Um, there are more slides that, that are very useful, for example, looking at ethical risk analysis and um, what stakeholders means and who the stakeholders are and power um, in difference in decision making. All of that, I hope, are, are additional resources. But I thank you for uh, tolerating my voice and listening to me, and I hope I can answer it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Susan. And I think there are many questions that are coming in. So Larry wants to know how do academic institutions break down the siloed and insular approach to learning? Should in multidisciplinary work places uh, should be reflected in multidisciplinary curricula intentionally designed in higher education? Yes. Well, um, that is a question for, I think it starts with presidents. Presidents have to care that the world is not siloed. Um, presidents of universities have to set the tone. Like leaders in families, like leaders of the world, like leaders of any organization, private, nonprofit, governmental, uh, leaders set the tone for what is priority. And in the best of universities like Monash, uh, what you hear from a president's 
now is indicative of their values. And I can see what is reflected in their curricula that is a reflection of what they value. And that doesn't come out of nowhere. That comes from leadership. And if the head honcho and the boss doesn't care about it, it's not going to happen. Once that person that cares leaves, probably return to the norm. Organizations and systems like the status quo, like the human body. We love homeostasis. We do everything in our power to stay the same. We do not want to interrupt the status quo. But it starts with leaders. It starts with the person at the top. Um, and, it's, and it's not just a unique to education. It's the same in healthcare. It's the same in, in the finance industry. It's the same in, in the aeronautical industry. Same everywhere. Silos are sort of the human way of, of compartmentalizing, you know, thousands of decisions. But the world is not the same today as it was before. So multidisciplinarity, interdisciplinary, must hopefully stay get to a place where it's important and prioritized. But it doesn't happen uh, in a vacuum. It must begin at the top. Next question. Um, my question was really beyond uh, uh, a university about how an engineering workplace could go about integrating um, education and training to make up for the educational gap that, that many universities have at this point. Um, are there, there some thoughts on how we can build this with our experienced engineering group as well? Absolutely. Uh, so I'm a part of IEEE and we are uh, building something called PACE, it's an ethical certification program. So IEEE is actually probably at the forefront in comparison to ISO, who's also trying, and IEC and JEC and all the uh, standards development organizations. IEEE is building a consortia, uh, uh, an ecosystem of, of ethical um, consideration components at the training, at the standards level, where uh, we can be brought in to to help, uh, to help a mature organization, a developing organization, understand how to uh, build capacity and human performance in their engineers that are existing in their organization. Absolutely. There's, there's lots of resources, and please feel free to email me if, if you would like some more details. That's great. I will do that. I'm not sure if this is hard to tell, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, okay. So your focus was on the engineering portion of the curriculum. There's a general ed portion of the curriculum where engineering students get to interact with our other disciplines. And oftentimes, those are the, the people from those disciplines are the ones who are requesting that the engineers do certain things. And I think that interaction is, is critically important. Uh, and I will tell you that as a freshman, I had a course that was somewhat like that. And uh, I just retired about a year ago, and I still remember things from that course that have influenced me over the years. Fantastic. Yes. You know, it's, it, we have these, these stories of these one teacher or this one course or uh, a year with, with a teacher. Um, next to a parent, a teacher or professor is probably one of the most important people in your life that has generally influenced tremendous professional success. And so, yes, engineering can purposefully create these experiences and moments where engineers deliberately are um, reaching across subject matter, reaching across disciplinary uh, limits and boundaries, and engaging with what they will have to do as, as professionals. And so, yes, I'm, I'm all for that. But also just take note that I'm, I'm espousing here a systemic approach to uh, a president at a university looking at their whole curricula and saying, not just here, let me give you some codes of ethics you can talk about, or here, let's just have a little one credit course on ethics. You know, yes, most people will do that. I'm talking about a lot of people getting together to really deliberately create purposeful ethical reasoning, ethical risk analysis across the curriculum. 
in a multidisciplinary fashion in the way, in, in some ways that, that one asked. Great comment though, yes. You can always remember a great teacher. They make a difference, they make a difference. They make a difference to the character in somebody and how that person decides um, their ethical decisions in, in the present and in the future. It, it wasn't the teacher, it was the course itself. Oh, the course itself? Did, was there yeah. a good teacher and, for and the so course? I guess what I'm, what I'm suggesting is that while focusing on ethics for engineers or engineers are talking to engineers, I believe it's important that there's something along the lines of ethics where engineers are interacting with other disciplines. For example, the people who will become city planners, the people who will become uh, business, business managers, and all those other disciplines that are going to put pressure on engineers to do things that may or may not be ethical, and the earlier you learn to interact and deal with the way those folks think, which is different than the way engineers think, the easier time you'll have as a professional engineer. Absolutely. I completely agree. Completely. We have time for one more. Uh, Giselle, um, universities seem to have abandoned fulsome education for expeditious education. Um, my tenure was 1968 to 72, which obviously a long time ago. Oh, during my undergraduate years, there were required courses in humanities for science majors, courses in sciences for humanities majors, in addition to their degree majors. And what this led to is a humanist scientist or a scientist humanist at the end of uh, their their four-year degree. Would you advocate for major educational reform in universities so that we can have people leaving universities who would be comfortable and could ostensibly switch even between disciplines? I can tell you that it does work because I've done it. I went from sciences back into humanities, into social sciences, and back into sciences. Yeah, uh, I think I, I I probably would have been I would have wanted to be a neurosurgeon thinking about it. But um, yes, absolutely. Um, can we can we prescribe or ascribe those kinds of uh, decisions to to different jurisdictions with different priorities and different values? I don't know. Uh, education reform. I uh, by the way, I wrote about education reform um, in 1990 or so have uh, an article in ASU's EPAA, Educational Policy Analysis Archives, and education reforms are notoriously unsuccessful uh, across decades because it comes down to more the economic model upon which the education is based, simply also similar to the healthcare issue, um, the economics behind how you educate people matters. The economics behind how you provide health or sick care uh, matters. And so until economic models reflect the priorities of someone that could be multidisciplinary, you know, those stars very rarely align. But yes, would I espouse that someone that um, has more than one deep uh, discipline in their background be presidents? Yes, it would help, but will it will it make a difference? I don't know. Those are too many. There's too many dependencies and too many um, too many issues. But yeah, I, you know, the people that I meet that that are uh, learned, uh, regardless of degree, tend to think outside of their particular domain, and and people like that are rare. People like that are very rare. Thank you for that comment. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on, we have uh, a question coming in from Neil. Uh, Neil, please go ahead with your question. Dr. Waters, thank you so much for this approach. Um, you know, flooded with uh, opportunists who have uh, directed this conversation to ethics per se. And um, it isn't helpful. It's all carried in no stick. Uh, because what happens is if people come back from these training courses and they understand what they're talking about. But um, they have things to say. We do things around here. And they're too timid to speak up. And that's, that's what I'm seeing a lot of. Yeah. 
Well, I'm glad that you liked uh, my approach. I, I joined IEEE uh, three years ago to try to begin to understand this question. How is it that we, are, we can do better with our machines? How, who will do better with our machines? How, who cares? And so, uh, you know, this is volunteer work in which, it, you know, it's on top of the jobs. And, and I have learned so much in attending, you know, I've, it's more than one standard. It's about four standards and the certification program. But learning how difficult it is for groups of people with conflicting interests and a competing value system work together across geographic boundaries and disciplines has been an immense lesson. And so I moved from my standards development work into analyzing engineering education because I think, wow, I mean, I was an educator anyway. So it, it needs to start here. It needs to start here. The, the questions, the conversations, the debate, it should begin with engineers now, more so now than ever before. So thank you for that comment. Thank you. And we have one last question that is coming in from uh, Sanchez. Uh, Sanchez, I'm going to unmute you now. Please go ahead with your question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hello. Hi, Doctor. Hello, Doctor Waters. Yeah, and my question was: How is possible to guarantee that engineering projects from academia have the attention from governments or policymakers for an approach into social inclusion, and not only to profit based on the settings established by the first world nations? <laughs> okay, so it's the same way that any academic project gets attention. Right? It means that the individuals who are doing the science, the individuals that are doing the research, the, the organizations that support their research, the grants that financially support those people, it means that those people say, I must bring this attention to this issue by reaching out to regulators, by reaching out to legislators. I, I've never been shy about asking anyone for help. So, it's not difficult for me to see how people that are doing incredibly great work can now move into a highlighted attention uh, marketing mode of saying, look, we think we've got a great model. Could you please take a look at it? If you don't ask, you're not going to know. So the researchers and the scientists and the engineers doing the research and science on this issue are actually doing an incredible job of trying to bring attention to what's happening in the AI space and the AI ethics. There are thousands of people trying to bring attention in, in, in a multitude of ways, some more successful than others, some terribly so. But that's just the nature of being human, right? It's going to be a normal distribution. There's going to be some leaders and there's going to be laggards. But you must ask. If you're doing some great work that you think a legislator or a regulator needs to see, ask, engage, reach out, do the outreach, because it's not going to happen otherwise. Excellent. And I have another one, if I may. Are the open access and open source initiatives help to discern feasibility and also the edits in engineering projects? Can you say that last part again? Yeah, I, I, I said, are the open access and open source initiatives help to discern the, the feasibility and also the edits in engineering projects? Yeah, so actually open source um, organizations and whether they be private, non nonprofit or whatever, they're actually doing some great work. Um, not all of them, just like anything else. But what's interesting about the open source community is there's a there's a different sense of 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 uh, well, distributed community. It's not just about my work, right? It's our work, and so the open source initiatives are extremely interesting as a human activity overall. To me, it's it's an interesting dynamic because it means a group of people have decided to really be open and let go of 
what could be IP or what could be profit making activity. So yes, they are great sources of tap into in terms of brain power and human capacity to help understand this issue in much in much better ways that is not necessarily always contradicting to, well, if I start thinking about ethics, I'm gonna reduce my profit because then I have to change my model. No, the open source community is kind of interesting in that they start from the premise of, let's begin with how is it that we get, we more than me, more than organization, more than my team gain from this. That's the whole notion of open sourcing. So. They're a fascinating community. I haven't studied them nearly enough, um, but there's only one lifetime, so. <laughs> Excellent, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for spending the time and, and tolerating me and, and listening to me. Uh, it's been very excited. I was very nervous, but I got through it and I hope you enjoyed it and learned, and learned some things.